from the book of Luke chapter 4. He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, hear yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we had heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. But Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow of Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which they, their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. As you sit down, I just want you to whisper to somebody next to you, thank you for being here. Just a whisper. Thank you for being here. We're, we're, we're at the end of our Be Well series, uh, caring for Adventist distinctives in a good and beautiful theological way that brings wellness to all. This is our, our last Sabbath of that, and um, it's been a, a fantastic ride. We've had the opportunity to talk about some of the unique things that make our, our family, our, our peoples, our denomination, our church, our home weird, and some of the things that makes us beautiful. And all through it, watching how God uses imperfect ways, imperfect people, and an imperfect system to do goodness into the world that we're in. So, the last of this series, it will be on the gift of prophecy. Have you ever gotten a gift that, you, you, that was really a responsibility? Have you ever gotten a gift like that? That you thought, oh, great, and then you realize with time, wait a minute, this was a trick. This is not what I was expecting. I grew up in a house of a, of a gardener. My dad is a gardener. And I remember after school, he'd pick us up, and then we'd go, and he'd do his route, and, you know, we'd be sitting his clients, and I would just sit there, you know, and I'd be like, Dad, when is the day I get to mow that lawn? I really want to do it. Dad, when is the day I can get behind the weed whacker, man? I think I can do this. You know, and as a kid, you're just watching your, your dad do it and your older brother and your family. You're just like, I can do this. And so, so I kept asking. And one day, my dad gave me the gift of being able to start mowing lawns. <laughs> and I just thought, yes, I have arrived. I can use the lawnmower 10 years later. I was like, why did I ever want to get behind this gift? This is the worst. Ten years later, my dad wakes me up early in the morning. Hey, let's go. No, dad, I don't want the gift anymore. It's too late. It's too late. It's yours, buddy. Gifts that are actually responsibility. Maybe you're the eldest in your home, and you were the first to get your driver's license, and that may have felt like a gift until you had to drive everyone around, right? Oh, dad, why? Because you've got a driver's license. No. Um, I, I grew up, in, and I didn't get my first car until I was here at La Sierra University, and we were living with a, a bunch of us guys who weren't very wealthy. We didn't have much money. Um, one of them may be on our pastoral staff now. I don't want to confirm or deny that. Uh, another one is a pastor in L.A. who may have been a chaplain here at one point. I don't want to confirm nor deny that. There was a bunch of us poor guys living together, eating out of one bowl, living out of one room, and doing our best. And I got a car, and it was the first car I'd ever gotten, and it was a free car. One of my other friends who was returning back to his homeland said, hey, I'm not coming back. Would you like my car? And I said, what a gift. Yes. And when he gave me the car, I didn't realize that that gift was actually a responsibility in disguise. Because it's from that point forward, hey, Icky, would you drive us here? Hey, Icky, would you drive us there? Hey, Icky, no, I don't want to take the car. I finally just gave the car away. Because I didn't realize how much of a responsibility this gift actually was. Sometimes as a church, we think about the gift of prophecy. 
what it means to be a prophet, oh, the great honor and respect and how we hail a particular individual for their, for their, for their prophetic ways. And we don't realize that behind the prophet, there are responsibilities, there are heartbreaks, there are children, there's, there's the, the all night I can't sleep because I think about where is this church going to go? Will it love as God calls it to love? Can we take this to the world? We don't think about the responsibilities of a prophet. And we turn to this gift of prophecy. This distinctive can be a little broad and aloof because when we say gift of prophecy, some people immediately think of the great controversy, right? The, the spirit of prophecy often many times we think of. Others would think of speaking in tongues or or uh, miraculous healings. Other people think about uh, apocalyptic eschatology, this, this, this uh, telling of the end and how it's gonna turn out. And so where do we land when it comes to prophecy, the gift of prophecy? The gift of prophecy is one of our fundamental beliefs and it speaks, we can't speak of it unless we speak of the name Ellen G. White. As stated here in our fundamental beliefs on your screen, the scripture testifies that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. This gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church, and we believe that it was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White. Her writings speak with prophetic authority and provide comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction to the church. They also make clear that the Bible is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. Mm. This is our fundamental belief. Again, not a creed, just a belief we have in common that's, uh, that's common. And yet we state it officially. So let's talk about the prophet and prophets and Jesus in his prophetic work. Prophets didn't just talk about the ethereal someday. Prophets weren't the ones who just talked about that day or gave you doom and gloom about the, the apocalyptic ending of the world. I know we think of, of prophets that way, and mainly may, maybe because it's part of our narrative, so close to us, that that's how we immediately interpret prof, uh, the prophet or prophecy or prophetic talk. But prophets don't just talk about that ethereal someday. They also spend a lot of time talking about the riven and broken today. So they don't just look out into the distance, but they're looking here. And uh, believe it or not, the majority of work they do actually belongs in the here and the now. As they look around into the broken systems, into uh, the riven world, into injustices, into um, uh, the, the things that happen, the inequities that happen around us. And these prophets always speak out against these things. In the Hebrew scriptures, we notice that there's quite a few prophets from Jeremiah to Samuel to Nathan to Jonah to, to Isaiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Micah. And the list goes on and on and on of prophets. These prophets were shakers and movers. They were the ones who uh, were integral to the formation of leaders and administrators for kings and kingdoms. They were calling for the community to repent from doing uh, uh, what they were doing to justice and uh, repent them back to goodness. They played a fairly large role in the national life and shaping their immediate world, as well as being a contradictory figure towards authoritative powers. Prophets often spoke up in a contradictory way to the system that is aligned and that is moving. They spoke against not just kings, but against priests. They were the ones who shook up things. Here's a few of them, Samuel when Samuel calls Saul and anoints him to kingship. And then again, when he has to denounce Saul, Samuel steps back in as a prophet with a prophetic voice because Saul wasn't being the king that, that God intended for the kingdom. And then Saul, Saul, uh, Samuel again, he anoints David to be the king. So he, he, he puts the king in place, he puts the king in his place, and then he puts a new king in place all in his time. Nathan to David, when David had the debacle and the, uh, uh, the incident he had with one of his uh, soldiermen. Nathan with Bathsheba, when David was older in age and Bathsheba and her son were, were in danger of being uh, executed or maybe thrown out. 
Nathan steps in for her. He comes and gives her counsel. She goes back into King David's courts, and then he comes in, and he helps move that all along for Solomon. Elijah to Ahab. Ahab married a Sidonite, and she had many uh, gods of Baal in the, in, the, in the nation. And so Elijah had to come forward and say, Ahab, this is not the way of the Lord. Isaiah to the people. So not only does the prophet do this for kings and for those in authority, but, but God speaks through prophets to the people. When the people need to shape up or change or when the people goes in the wrong direction, God calls in the prophets. Here in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17, learn to do good. Seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. Because Israel had lost its way. It was taking advantage of all these particular people groups. Micah, Micah says this in chapter 6, verse 8, very familiar to all of us. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. Zechariah, prophet, he speaks to the people, thus has the Lord of hosts said, dispense true justice and practice kindness and compassion each to his brother and do not press the widow or the orphan and the stranger or the poor and do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. Ezekiel, the prophet, speaks. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Amos speaks up. Amos, therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from the, the levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink of their wine. You see, over and over again, the prophets are not just speaking about a someday, they are speaking about a today. The prophetic voice of the biblical text calls us to magnify and look into our spaces today and see where injustice and hate and anger and division and rivenness and brokenness and ugliness live and then speak into those places life. Jesus in Luke 4, he's in this rhythm of the prophets. He steps up in the synagogue. He opens the scrolls. He looks directly for Isaiah. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recover of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, when the people heard this, they were excited. Whoa, Jesus, yes, you are our kind of prophet. That's what we want. But that's before Jesus clarifies his statement. Just before we go to Jesus' clarifying statement, I want to return back to Ellen G. White. So here we are as we talk about Ellen G. White who is, I, I, I think too often we get into arguments about whether Ellen G. White was a prophet or not, and we've made this so binary that you can either like Ellen G. White or you can just dismiss Ellen G. White. But I think there's a powerful, beautiful Ellen G. White between these spaces that we can celebrate and say, wow, she, she, she is doing some beautiful, amazing, wonderful, glorious things. She is more than just a prophet. So firstly, to be fair, Ellen G. White, she's never called herself or claimed to be a prophet. Let's clarify that. This is uh, one of her writings here, Selective Messages, book one. To claim to be a prophetess is something that I have never done. I have never done, she says. If others call me that name, I, I have no controversy with them. But my work has covered many lines that I cannot call myself other than a messenger sent to bear a message from the Lord to his people and to take up work in any line that he points out. Ellen G. White wasn't worried about well, how people entitled her. Her whole point was that she just wanted to do God's work here on earth. And she wanted to do it well. And she wanted to raise a church that would do these things. 
And so I think as we're operating from this place, um, it's, it's important for us to recognize who she is as our co, as co-founder, as, as the mother figure of our church, um, and the challenges that she had to go through. Because of the title that was appointed to her as prophetess, we should understand a few things about her context as a leader. Ellen G. White was a female leader in the 1800s. Dare I say, it's a difficult thing to be a female leader in our church today. She was a female leader, a visionary leader, a prolific leader in the 1800s. She came from a place of low education. She didn't have the wonderful privilege of getting that d that PhD. She wasn't an MDiv student. She didn't get her undergraduate degree. She didn't even get a high school diploma. She was struck in the face with a rock that caused severe pain and severe struggles early on in life to a place where she, she felt like she may not even go, go, go further in her life. Ellen G. White lived in a world where she could not vote. The 1800s, women were not allowed to vote. You had no, literally in the, in the world that you live in, the world told you, you don't get a voice. Ellen G. White is living in this context. She didn't always agree, she didn't always agree with the church leaders and the presidents in place. Man, can, can, I mean, can I just say how bold this lady is? Right? When we come up against obstacles, when we come up against challenges, most of us, after we've come up with a challenge or two, we back off. This lady wasn't going to back off. She has low education. She was injured. She uh, was a female in this context, and yet she said, no, I'm going to press forward. Dr. Gail Valentine, in his book, The Prophet and the Presidents, writes this about her relationships to presidents. The level of spirituality, Ellen G. White uh, writes, the the level of spirituality and loyalty among conference presidents also distressed her deeply. She had not much confidence. She suggested in uh, in many of them, many presidents of conferences, she believed, needed to be replaced. They do not answer the measurement of God and were therefore unfit for the work and should be dismissed. Wow. You've got this system that's running. Hey, let's just keep it all together. You know, we're, this is our fundamental belief. This is what we're going to do. Well, they didn't have it then, but the, you know, you get the idea. We're trying to run a church here. And I like, no, no, no. We, no, we can't just run a church. We've got to run the right kind of church. We can't just come together on Sabbath and have good music and have prayer and have a sermon, we've got to be a real kind of church that is about the business of God every day. We can't just be Seventh-day Adventists. As as immigrants say, we've got to be seven days Adventists. Amen. She was such a thorn in the church's side. It's funny because we've kind of sanctified her. Now that she's passed, do everything in LNG. We, we use LNG White for everything. And, and, and they were doing it at the time. And, and LNG White was actually fighting back. She's like, no, I, I, don't, I think you're wrong. She wasn't that, you know, when you see this picture of LNG White, it's an older lady. She looks like she could be your grandma. Maybe not all of yours, but she definitely looked like she could be my grandma. And you think she's sweet and kind, but no, LNG White had a backbone. She had a vision. She, she knew what she wanted of the church. And she wasn't just going to let some president, some man push her around. She had, a, she, had, she had vision. In fact, she, she was in di- disagreement and, and debate so often and, 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 and in that kind of way with different kind of authorities that they sent her away. They sent her down to Australia. You know you're not getting along when you send someone away to Australia. Love to the Australians. No, but just think about it, right? Because today we can get on a plane and fly to Australia. They made this 60-some-year-old lady get on a boat and ride the boat for months, which, surprisingly, she lived through. She didn't want to go, friends. She didn't get along with the president. Here's what she wrote about this little exchange. She writes it to, uh, to the president of the time. 
and she says, the Lord was not in our leaving America. He did not reveal that it was his will that I should leave Battle Creek. The Lord did not plan this, but he let you all move after your own imaginings. The Lord would have had W.C. White, his mother, and her workers remain in America. We are needed at the heart of the work. And had your spiritual perception discerned the true situation, you would never have consented to the movements made. But the Lord read the hearts of all. There was so great a willingness to have us leave that the Lord permitted this thing to take place. Those who were weary of the testimonies born were left without the persons who bore them. Our separation from Battle Creek was to let men have their own will and way, which they thought superior to the way of the Lord. That's some fire. L.G. White was not playing around. That, that was that's pretty close to hate mail right there. I want us to grasp a picture of L.G. White. That's much larger than, than the one that we, we've, we've kind of been battling through over and over in the years. I want us to see her for more than the titles that people have given her. L.G. White had to contend with male-dominant leadership. It was all around her. It was what pressed her, I believe, to do better than everyone else. She wouldn't just let another person carry on. She said, oh, you're going you're gonna to be this? Then I'm going to be this. President, I'm the prophet. Whoa. Watch this. Here's a picture of her and her family. Um, in, in, in family photos, usually someone would be holding a book here. Um, generally, men would be holding the books because a book was a sign of wisdom, leadership, confirmation. So the next year when they take the photograph, this is what the photo looks like. Look <laughs> at my girl, Ellie, yo, yo. She's not even subtle about it. She's like, here it is. <laughs> know who I am. <laughs> Could you believe the guts of this lady? In the, the 1800s, everyone is going to be against you in this move, Ellen G. White. Oh, it's okay. I'm going to take my Instagram shot. You can see it. You got to know who I am. Here's uh, 1901, the General Conference. If you look closely at this photo, this is the General Conference, as probably represents almost as it is today, but generally mostly all male. In fact, this one, all male. And at the center of the pulpit, who do we see? Little O. Allen G. White. Because she just couldn't let dominant culture continue to carry the narrative. Talk about power and courage. A mom of four, two have passed, two were still there. At this time, James had passed on. She's doing the work and she's crying and she doesn't know what to do. And I'm sure it had to feel lonely. But Ellen G. White had to be all these things. She knew that in order for this infant church filled with dispute, financial need, growing pains, and male-dominant leadership, that she had to be more than a prophet. But she couldn't be any less than a prophet. She had to be prophet plus, but she couldn't be any less than a prophet. Otherwise, they would take authority. Here she, she or she um, writes selected messages. My work includes more than this name, Signifies name being prophet. I regard myself as a messenger entrusted by the Lord with messages for his people. You see, Lady White, she knew what was on her shoulders. She knew the language of the time and what it meant to have to carry a load, what it meant to have to protect and care for, what it meant to look out into a broken world and lead an infant church into making a difference. Back to Jesus. Jesus points out the prophets call the people to include those they would rather not. So in our text, just a little bit further down from the point where he reads Isaiah, 
the people are, are excited. And then Jesus, he says, truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in a prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah. And then he continues to go on and say that the only one that Elijah visited was the widow at Zarephath in Sidon. And then he talks about Elisha's experience and all the lepers that were part of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the people of Israel. And yet the only leper that was healed was Naaman. Jesus' point here being, you were excited when I read that this is the year of the Lord because you thought I was talking for you. But in reality, I was talking to you. In reality, this is not about you get to celebrate the year of the Lord. It is about you going out and bringing those who are outside of our tribe to get enjoy and experience the year of the Lord. When the church becomes a place that is only about us and what we are comfortable with, we are missing the mission of God. Please hear me. Because there are people around the world right now who think that they are doing the will of God as they spread hate, as they, as they incite anger, as they're willing for others to take violence in the name of Jesus. And that is not the way of God. The way of God is a way of love. The way of God lifts people up. The way of God includes those who are not a part of our tribe. Prophetic voice. Jesus tells them, this is not about you. So don't make it about you. This is about going out and loving the world as God loves. Prophetic voice stands up against injustice and inequity and solipsistic homogeny. This desire to be us and be awesome. And we don't like it when we see it in people. We call that racism. We see it in class, people with different colors, that's classism. We don't realize that we do it in our own denomination. A prophetic voice speaks up for people who are left out. So this, this series was about that prophetic voice, the health message. It's not an industry, and it's not meaningful because if you, you eat the right things, all of a sudden God's going to love you more. No. Listen, if you stop eating cheese, you're just going to stop eating cheese. <laughs> and good for you. I have a hard time. But guess what? The Lord loves me just as much as he loves you. It's, a salvific, it's salvific because it brings wellness and goodness to people's lives. The sanctuary doesn't only remind us that God is for us and is our advocate, but it's also a reflection of Christ that we should be for others and advocate for others. The Sabbath gives us a value of worth that is outside of our title outside of our production, outside of what we can bring to this place. It reminds us that we are valuable to God, whether we are amazing and successful or whether we're not doing well at all. And present truth pushes us forward. You see, Ellen G. White, this, this is prophetic work. Sure, she mentioned things about bicycles, not having them. I hear people, well, didn't she not want us to ride bicycles? Yes, of course. Yeah, but the bicycle cost like $4 billion back in the day. And she was thinking about you and what would be most best for your community. Well, she didn't talk about social justice issues, Pastor. None of those are really social justice issues. Well, since you said that, let me just put this up on the screen. She had a few things to say about racism. And this land of light... A system is cherished which allows one portion of the human family to enslave another portion. Degrading millions of human beings to the level of the brute creation. The equal of this sin is not to be found in the heathen lands. God is punishing this nation for the high crime of slavery. 
He has the destiny of the nation in his hands. He will punish the South for the sin of slavery and the North for so long suffering its overarching and unbearing influence. She had things to say about race. Because the prophetic voice is not just about the someday. It's about the today. And to be the kind of church that follows prophetically, we must be willing to stand with Jesus and say, and protect and guard and practice that all are welcome here. Be well.